the Greek philosopher Plato once said that when the music changes, governments fall. Can I just have one comment, please, for Gary? Uh, uh, I'm terribly sorry. Look, I'm sorry. I, 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 I would, but look, I've got to get home to watch Countdown. Everybody say, everybody do. Rock and roll might just be the music that would shake down the fabric of Western civilization. This series is the inside story on Australia's unique contribution to the worldwide phenomenon of rock and roll. They walk in, you hear a PA that was going, <laughs> a voice going, <laughs> Holy Jesus, I'm going to hell. <laughs> I didn't want to give anyone the chance to sort of, you know, take a beer glass and take aim, so I thought just keep moving. We were all wearing black, we all had stupid hairdos, you know, we were all sniffing ammo, we were all falling over on mandrax, we were all getting pissed until we, you know, couldn't remember what day it was. I've done, I've done a whole gig at lunch with you lying on my back once on the New Year's Eve because I'm so pissed. We, we were often thought uh, an appropriate headline for the group would have been Seekers Clean Up Hotel Room. <laughs> The wild one really was a wild one, don't you worry about that. I'd wake up in the morning, there'd be 20 girls watching me sleep. We all like it so bad, you know. It's almost Why did like you a... kick me out, Sean? <laughs> oh, God, can I get a better one than that? Fuck you. Bang. Bram. Oh, I would never play my records. Never. Ooh. Yeah, well, I've always thought we were dance men. I used to delight pulling up at a set of traffic lights with, you know, some sort of music pumping out of the window, just... Songwriting is a human, desperate scavenging act, nothing to do with coming through the air or God. Well, songs come from God, of course. You haven't been, like, spokespeople for a generation or anything, we just do our thing. Davey revving up my motors ready to take a flying start into the good old game of snatch and grab. In the early 1950s, Australia was enjoying a period of post-war calm. <laughs> On the wireless, amongst the radio plays and variety shows, came the sounds of Nat King Cole, Benny Goodman, or perhaps Tex Morton. <laughs> Teenagers had not existed before the war, but suddenly they were everywhere, looking for a hook to hang their angst upon. It would come from the United States. That hook was rock and roll. first Australian teenagers to play rock and roll drums was Leon Isaacson. His 8mm road movies are classic little documentaries of the era. These four days in, in 1956 were the best four days of my life because I actually got a set of drums, a set of real drums, and I had a girlfriend. So everything was... I was away. Rock and roll itself started at the oh. movies. Singer Lonnie Lee was down there in the stalls when Blackboard Jungle hit Australian cinemas. I can remember walking down George Street with a couple of my friends to go and see it. And it was really exciting. I was, I think I was about 16, 16 or 17. And uh, we went into the movie and the, the, the music came on and oh, mercy, I swear. Five, six, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, rock. Nine, ten, eleven o'clock, twelve o'clock. The people were, were thumping on the floor with their, with their feet to the beat of the thing and and um, uh, clapping and yelling. It was like a live performance. Built 
Bill Haley's Rock Around the Clock was the theme tune for a gritty film about high school delinquents. It looks... you can't even see it. <laughs> but it does say, Rock Around the Clock, A Foxtrot, by Bill Haley and his Comets. Its brief burst of revved-up rockabilly started the original overnight sensation. You sort of knew there was something new happening because people were wearing different stuff, you know. She had all these things like seal out alligator on the back and pedal pushes and they're all dressed different. Whether that was just me suddenly being a sexually awakened. It was a cha, 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 that's it, that gave a lot of those rockabilly uh, dancers and rock and roll dancers the emphasis when they were dancing. And so it was that fun, that, that, mm, that excitement, that edge. And that was, uh, that was the thing that got uh, the rock and roll dancing going. Immediately there was intense competition to be Australia's first rock and roll band and cut the first record. People still argue about who got there first. But early gigs by the Thunderbirds packed out local dance halls in Melbourne. We'd been suppressed. Teenagers had been suppressed up to then. Sit there, shut up, don't do anything, you know? The surge of support was so huge that moral panic duly set in. The rebellious devil's, youth, the devil's music, the devil's my mother used to call it. Teenage rebellion, so, yeah, you know, that's what it was. kids ripping out seats out of piano, uh, picture theatres, the movies and stuff, and there was people bashing each other up in dances. You only had to say the wrong thing, and, or look at the, a, a girl the wrong way, and boy, for all. Yeah. Oh, yeah, they were, they were pretty wild, and there was, there was um, suburban-oriented groups and gangs, and they used to sort of meet at times. <laughs> Unknown to most Australians, the seeds of this new music were already here years before. During World War II in the pubs and clubs of Sydney's King's Cross, the initiated few jitterbugged the nights away with partying American GIs. It was these same rhythms that captivated Australia's hybrid youth cults, the bodgies and the widgies. To be cool, you had pig trousers and wide shoulders and the, and the, the correct haircut, whether it be crew cut or Sleek back. You can go to a dance, Surreyville in Sydney, you had five saxes, five trumpets, four trombones, and, and they were playing big band jazz. But it had a similar beat to, to rock, you know. Rock wasn't that far away from it. It's just simpler. Jazz musicians might be hip to the beat, but a rock and roll band needed a front man. When Johnny O'Keefe grabbed the microphone in 1956, Australia got its first rock and roll icon. We used to do dances all over the place. And the kids were all dancing, sweaty hot night in January, and then Johnny would come on and they'd roar their heads off, you know, and they didn't know they were dancing to jazz solos and all that stuff. It was just, <laughs> but it was, it was rock jazz solos, you know. The wild one really was a wild one, don't you worry about that. On stage, he, he was just, you know, like he was just like a black soup star sometimes. Raw, hard, raucous, dirty, rude. You call, you call it what you like. He was so, so powerful with, and dynamic and, and he, he had this charisma wherever he went, you know, on stage or on television, or he had this charisma that no one seems to have had before and, and ever will. Johnny O'Keefe had everything. Sex appeal, cheek and personal skills he learned as a salesman selling furniture. I had an orange uh, velvet suit with black uh, well, I remember around the lapels and then uh, encrusted with diamonds. Diamond, yeah, he was a pair pressed. of shoes with uh, jewels in the heels and capes and all the full gear. There was no Australian rock industry until Johnny. He would have to create it. I became promoter, singer, bouncer, door attendant, sold the ice creams, mixed the drinks and cleaned the toilets.
he'd do a cover, which was better than the original. Usually black black groups, you know, he, we weren't hearing them. We didn't have any black music here. It wasn't being played, so he c was very smart. Cotton onto that, just the way to go. While rock and roll was based on rhythm and blues, it also had country roots. Oh, they call me the creamy. I live out of town. I live with my mother. Australia already had a strong country music scene based on the bush ballad. The country twang had a soothing effect, something sweet to calm the angst of the more respectable kids. Darling, I could never be ashamed of you. If Johnny O'Keefe was the wild urban animal, Colin Jacobson was the well-mannered country gentleman. Me being a, a cowboy follower, hillbilly follower, hillbilly music at the time they called it, uh, it was a normal extension for me to go across into the field of Bill Haley and and Elvis Presley. And we all tried to emulate Presley. In a cabin, crazy cowboy. brother Kevin worked out a rock and roll business plan at the kitchen table in the Sydney suburb of East Hills. I remember going to the accountants, the guy and said I'm going to leave because I'm going to be I'm with my brother Cole and uh, we're going to be rock and roll stars. And he said rock and roll, it's a child the accountants office, rock and roll stars. <laughs> they made their own primitive guitars and amplifiers and with a little homemade electricity played American country tunes sped up without the fiddles. Mine was a, a doozy because you had to stand on a rubber mat to play it and every now and again if you touch the microphone with your mouth or your nose, it's used to short out and you'd get the biggest blue flash and the, the amalgam in your teeth would rattle and you'd lose two bars and then you'd say, ooh. On the advice of a clairvoyant, Colin changed his name to Col Joy and thanks to that killer smile, he was soon hiring two secretaries to answer his fan mail, even rivalling the popularity of Johnny O'Keefe. Until then, we'd played uh, the local football dances and people's weddings and divorces and, and fights. They usually end up at fights. A teenage baby, I love you so The country gentleman and the wild one had laid the foundations for an industry, and it already had two distinct styles. Carl Joy was Mr Nice Guy, and he was always pleasantly uh, performing nothing obscene, whereas J.O.K. was masturbating his microphone and doing all these things that upset the parents. For a passing fad, Australian rock and roll was spreading far and deep. It could sustain anyone bold enough to strap on a guitar. With the end of six o'clock closing in Sydney, the pubs started bringing the new music into the bar. The enduring link between alcohol and rock and roll was firmly established. It wasn't exactly like happy days. There was a slightly more sinister, <laughs> sort of ominous feeling about a rock and roll dance. We moved locations because the parents and citizens keep closing us down and on one occasion somebody rode a horse into the hall and there were four fights on one night and three of them were amongst girls rolling over and over and, and biffing and scratching each other. Female performers were treated with the same respect as males. It was rough <laughs> and all these girls from the local home were all down the edge of the stage and I walked on. This night, and these girls went, I sing sad movies, oh well, woof and bunch your head in. <laughs> and I'm very tall, and I had spike heels on, so I was over six foot, and I leaned over and I went, You and what an army? <laughs> and they went, Oh, you're one of us. Some bands hired bouncers, like local footballers, to keep the crowds under control. The gentlemanly Joy Boys saved a few bomb by using their own muscle. They never even got out of their seats, it was just two hits, and they just sat there. 
kind of funny and they weren't there when the interval come on again. You can't do that nowadays, you know, times have changed. No, you get somebody to say, no, to say don't do that, lads. My friends uh, used to take me along to Johnny O'Keefe's dances and Cole Joy's dances and uh, used to try and get me on there and if they wouldn't let me up, they'd turn around and say, well, the dance might have to close down because we're going to cause a blue. Mark time! The community decided rock and roll culture had to be supervised. The police and the churches moved in to set up alcohol-free rock and roll nights. Rock and roll light might be a last chance to recruit a new congregation. A Saturday night in Sydney, and for teenagers such as these, there's something new in store, their own teenage cabaret. Well, it makes me want to sing and shout, Jesus is alive. I've got to get this message out, yes, he is alive. I never saw it as something satanic or something evil. I saw it as something liberating, and I felt greatly liberated by rock and roll. I loved it. There were the modern rhythms for dancing. Music with a tempo that might seem to exhaust all but the most enthusiastic. The tempo of rock and roll. Growing up through adolescence, you felt they expressed some of the, the feelings that you had when you were dating or, or, or apprehensive about approaching a girl for a date. And the songs gave you courage and uh, encouragement and, uh, and uh, you know, a real sort of interest in, in life. Just a closer walk with me. Rock and roll dancers may have been popular with the community, but they were still a bit like amateur talent night. It would take an American to turn rock and roll into a viable business opportunity and make real money from teenagers. Lee Gordon was a quiet, enigmatic and even shady character. Just the go-between Australia needed to connect to the international rock and roll circuit. Thank God for him, because without him it wouldn't have happened like it did. But then the rock thing happened and he had that great vision. He got the top people when they were hot, you know, bang, he's got them signed up. Gordon's philosophy was simple. What made money in America would make money here. It was a philosophy that made him bankrupt on a couple of occasions. But he set the style for the Australian rock and roll impresario, which colourful music business identities have been following ever since. Gordon couldn't get the real Elvis to tour. The next best thing, he decided, was the New Zealand version, Johnny Devlin. It was Johnny Devlin, the devils, or Satin Satan was, was one name I had. Uh, Another one was um, New Zealand's King of Rock and Roll. Another one was the Wanganui Whaler. America had, uh, had Elvis, England had Cliff Richard, Australia had Johnny O'Keefe, New Zealand had me. I think Germany had Heinz, or Europe had Heinz. So that was our introduction to Australia, the, the big audiences, 10,000-seater audiences at the stadium. The Sydney Stadium became the focus for Lee Gordon's rock and roll enterprise. Stadium gigs were wild extravaganzas. One newspaper said they were orgies of communal hysteria. But at first, Gordon was shy of booking local acts. Johnny was pleading with him and, and saying, you know, like, you, you know, We've got to get on there and, and let the people see us. You know, we're, we're, we're just as good as anybody else. And Lee was a bit hesitant, but he said, yes, OK. Johnny O'Keefe got uh, his chance in, uh, on the Bill Haley tour in 57, just simply to warm up the crowd. And I do know that in Sydney, that Johnny was booed when he first went on stage. I didn't know what to do, and I, I, I stopped at this particular night by saying, you may boo me, as they did when I first went on to the stadium, or you may uh, throw things at me, but you all pay your money to come and see me, because you all love me!
you. You look so good to me. Yeah. You know you make me want to shout. Put my hands up, 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 John would hold them in the palm of his hand, and, you know, he'd get out and say, I know that you love me, you know, and they'd cheer. And then right through the American acts, they'd do the same. We want John, we want John. It was, it was great. Johnny won the audience over, but not just for himself. His success persuaded Gordon to make local talent a regular feature of his touring circus. The Jacobson brothers saw Lee Gordon's success as an opportunity to set up their own touring business. Booking local acts into venues across the country turned out to be a shrewd move. We were all hot on the eve of a revolution, a music revolution, you know. And um, so uh, for us to be promoted by Lee Gordon was like big time, wasn't it? <laughs> you know, until we said, we, we can do this ourselves. <laughs> I was a fool for leaving, fool for saying goodbye. I was a fool for leaving, fool for saying goodbye. And now it hurts me so bad, gonna sit right down and cry. The first tour that I went on, uh, we had a spotlight. The people in the country hadn't seen the spotlight. They spent more time looking around and seeing where that light was coming from. As, well, and when you change colours with the lights on stage, wow, that was something else. There was a stampede by rock and rollers to get on the Jacobson bandwagon. We set about going to them, to their town, their town halls, winter garden theatres, picture theatres, ovals, and what a welcome. It used to be the horror stretch in the Red X trial. And we'd arrive with all the dust and, the, and there'd be some horrible hotel, but there'd always be all these wonderful people that had come for miles around in this crappy old hall. <laughs> 400, 500 miles a day was nothing. We'd do that, then we'd get there. Now, it was hard being a girl then, because most of the time we'd have to just fly just about on stage. You stayed at those hotels, in those old hotels that that they've been there since the 1890 or 1910. I mean, the beds all, all seen a thousand struggles. You get in and you roll straight in the middle. There was no getting out of them. You'd have a little iron and you're on the floor trying to iron and you had about three minutes you know, with hot rollers in your hair, and oh, it was just a nightmare. In those tours, we were seen as equals to the rest of the world, and that was the first time, you know, in, in great numbers, that Australian artists were accepted as being equal. Fans could see and hear bands live, but few of them were making records. To the record industry, rock and roll was still a passing fad, just a novelty, and like the local Holden car, it was still a repackaged American model. But something happened that was to make the record companies sit up and take notice. Country artist Slim Dusty had been trying to get a recording deal for years. In 1958, he recorded The Pub With No Beer. So it's a lonesome away from your kindred and all by the campfire at night where hear the wild dingoes call. But there's a nothing so lonesome morbid or drear than to stand in the bar of that pub with no beer. The first ever home-produced single to sell as well as US product in Australia, it also hit the charts in the UK. It's a miracle that our record sold because they, uh, you were given three hours to get your six tracks down and then you were ushered out very quickly and silently in case you bumped into a soprano or a baritone or somebody of importance, you know. But they didn't tell them that it was our record that kept them on, on the level, level on, kept them going. Slim opened the studio door for all kinds of guitar strumming talent. 
Johnny O'Keefe knew he needed a hit record for his own career and to prove that homemade rock and roll could also sell records. Ken Taylor, A&R manager of Australia's Festival Records, wasn't so sure until he heard a rumour that he'd already signed up Johnny. I spoke to Johnny O'Keefe on the phone and I said congratulations. He said, for what? I said, exactly. But I read that you have been signed exclusively to Festival Records. He said, uh, who is speaking? I said, the general sales manager and artist and repertoire manager of Festival Records. He said, well, am I signed with you? I said, I don't know. What do you sing like? His first efforts failed, but late one night after a gig in Sydney's Newtown, Dave Owens and Johnny Greenan came up with the right formula. Well, I'm a just out of school, back up real, real cool. Got a shake, got a jive, got the message that I got to feel alive. I'm a wild boy. Ooh, yeah, I'm a wild boy. Woo, baby, gonna break loose. I'm gonna keep a moving wild. I'm gonna keep a shaking, baby. I'm a real wild child. Original words and music from the rock and roll scene itself. Australia's first anthem to teenage angst. There was an Italian wedding going on downstairs. Halfway through the night, this all of a sudden our dance clears out and the kids are all gone. And I was saying, what's wrong? What's, our music's not that bad, you know, they've disappeared. So we went to the balcony and I overlooked and there's this huge brawl, the biggest brawl I've ever seen. The dance ended, we didn't finish it, and Dave and I went back to listen to some Miles Davis and have a couple of bourbon and cokes and sort ourselves out. We started writing these words down, it was as simple as that. It was quick, we didn't have any trouble, real wild child just out of school, we both contributed and we had all this stuff at the end of number two hours, about four o'clock in the morning, I went home. We took it in and said, hey John, uh, we wrote these words the other night, and John said, oh gee, I like this Wildman stuff, you know. Uh, what's the chord progression with Dave and I? I don't think we'd even discuss it. Oh, it's 12 bar blues. We'll make it a 12 bar blues. The Wild One success ushered in all kinds of acts through the foyer at festival, including the suitably sedate Joy Boys. Ken Taylor's success at festival was simple. He based his signings on how loud the female fans were screaming. That's how James Dean lookalike Big Richards got his gig. Let me say I might love you each night and day. I want to kiss you each night. Let me say I might kiss you each night and day. The recording technology was often primitive. Some of festival's best sellers sounded like they were recorded in the toilets, because they were. A lot of the, the early things we put out were very wimpy. Uh, compared to what we did live, like, we wouldn't dare go out and play some of those horrible things we recorded live, you know, they'd boo us off the stage. Everybody used the toilet echo. O'Keefe, Dig Riches, Nolene Batley, uh, Lucky Star, Cold Joy. If they got something new, I remember they got a set of temple blocks that went clock, clock, clock. Everybody had a temple block on the record because they had, it was new. Yeah, in straight language, some of the engineers, they were real, real bastards. They really were. That's the only way you can put it. And they made us feel very, very bad. What'd you think, old buddy? Beauty. Done it again. Beauty, beauty. No, the middle There's age. My intonation right in the middle yeah. age. Somehow, Johnny O'Keefe's recording sounded more spontaneous. A recording with him was, was quite remarkable, and, and that's reflected in, in songs like, for example, like Shout. Well, I think we did Shout in one take, and I think we had a, we had a few uh, scotches under the, under the belt during that, and uh, it was quite fun, really. Everybody accepted this. This was rock and roll, and this is how it went, and who cared whether the intonation was uh, a little loud or the timing was a little loud. It wasn't terribly important, as long as the atmosphere was captured, away we went. Festival Records became a hit factory. It even recorded Australia's first number one by a female artist, Nolene Batley's Barefoot Boy. But getting radio airplay was another matter. Melody, tempo, Timmer John on the outside, no man on the rails. I won't play any wild, really wild music. Three to be on three, OK, 12 minutes past 12, and our program is sing-along. Because of our musical policy, we will not play music that jars. Radio DJs were kings. 
If Bob Rogers put a single in his top 40 in Sydney, you could give up your day job. Our control of the music industry became very strong. If we didn't play a record, you could almost bet it wouldn't be a hit. In Melbourne, Stan Rofe was the first to play real rock and roll. He didn't care about the mums and dads. I call myself Stan the man, the rocky jockey. And I would not play a ballad if you gave me 500 pounds, I would not play a ballad. It was just simply rock and roll. She kissed me every morning, kissed me every Radio DJs took advantage of the tyranny of distance. It so happened Qantas airline stewards were bringing in brand new records by American stars way ahead of their release dates in Australia. I can tell you now that the, that the record companies here, like, you know, they, they had no idea. This meant Australian singers and bands could copy the best songs before anyone had heard them. We got our 30, 40, sometimes 50 odd records, our import service from the USA. So if I felt there was anything really good, and I mean really good, I put that record aside and I say, well, I'll give that to so and so. Please tell me, what am I gonna do? Hey. I put one on the turntable here, four bars, and no, that's no good. And we used to go through piles of these things. I could get, could get a local band or a local singer on the charts here, up to number one or top ten. Really, there was no motivation or any ideas for guys like us to write material. Some covers, like Betty McQuaid's Midnight Bus, were classier than the originals. I knew it would go well because of the reaction of the dancers. Uh, it was the only song that stopped them dancing. And if you could get the crowd to stop dancing while you were singing in Melbourne, you knew you had something there. Yeah, my baby, we But mass media itself was changing. By 1959, two-thirds of households in Sydney and Melbourne were now home to the one-eyed monster, television. But TV rock had to be handled with extreme caution, and for commercial TV, it had to be softer, lighter, mild. Channel 9's rock show Bandstand was hosted by a man who looked like a suburban bank clerk. The emphasis was on wholesome entertainment. Bye 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 baby goodbye. I gotta get going. Bye 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 baby goodbye. I had a lot of fun at the show tonight. Just a little closer that I'll hold you tight Bye, 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 baby, goodbye The Bandstand family, a small clique of regular guests, was as close as Australia ever got to the Royals, with Cold Joy elevated from Gentleman Rocker to TV's Prince Charming. It was a springboard for so many Australian artists that, uh, that are still around today. Well, so the Bandstand, Bandstand family just grew. We call it the Bandstand family. It was just sort of regular performers on, on Bandstand. Because I've been everywhere, man. I've been everywhere, man. Across the desert, spare man. I've breathed the mountain air, man. I've traveled, I've had my chair, man. I've been everywhere. Been to Talamore, Seymour, Liz, Mom, Luna, Bon, Nam, Bon, Rich, Tokyo, Mom. I'm on the throne. My raincoat in the river, going to Tyler. My umbrella in the sea. If Cold Joy was the prince, his princess was Judy Stone. I was very tiny and I used to sing all the songs that appealed to, to the mums and dads. 
That was had a few pluses, but then a few negatives because it was difficult for me to really get into really mature type songs that I really wanted to get my teeth into. They're gonna be some quaking and a whole lot of shaking. Everybody, it's a six o'clock. They're gonna be some singing and a whole lot of swinging. Everybody, it's a six In contrast, the ABC's Channel 2 took a chance. Six o'clock rock was for teenagers, not the whole family. To prove its credibility, the Wild One was hired as its host. Hi, once again, and welcome to uh, Six O'Clock Rock. We hope you're going to have a ball with us this afternoon. A particular hello to all the uh, people that are tuning in for the first time. We hope you like the session. Shoot the band! People accepted it for what it was, and of but course it was, it was so a... Different. It was raw, wasn't it? Oh, yes, it was a, it was a live show, and, and we tried to make it as brash and as rude and as whatever we could to, to sort of counteract the bandstand image which was our rival in those days. Again, Johnny O'Keefe was everywhere. This, this was original, it was a... Uh, uh, a powerhouse. 24 hours a day, I, after I started to get the television bug, I ate, uh, drank and slept uh, six o'clock rock. Johnny O'Keefe was the nicest person to meet, but when he was on the floor getting that show ready for six o'clock, Johnny was the hardest taskmaster I have seen. He chose the talent, he chose his songs, and if they didn't do it his way, his way, they were off the show. <laughs> oh, look. Johnny was in America yeah. and we went off to Foster for our honeymoon and uh, suddenly the next day, will you tell the story? Dear? Well, the proprietor of the motel rang and said, Mr O'Keefe, his wife, child and dog would be arriving that night. <laughs> yes, <laughs> so much for our honeymoon because John couldn't, he just couldn't keep away from the phone and he'd ring me 2, 3 a.m. in the morning whenever he had an idea. Hey, Pete, I've got an idea. Let's let's do this for the next show. And, of course, us being away on our honeymoon, that was the end of things for him, so he wanted to see us straight away, and, and uh, there he was. So we spent our honeymoon with Johnny O'Keefe, <laughs> the dog, Marianne and little John. Well, that girl and I, man, we're as happy as can be. Oh, I like her and she loves me. Oh, The TV effect could mean instant fame. Some musicians were now earning more than their parents and basking knee-deep in adulation. Something about television and movies, that if all these people were, were on the same box, they must all know each other, you know? It's like they'd see Elvis and then they'd see Dig or something, like and us, and it's like we, we knew Elvis, you know? Oh, great, good golly, it thrilled me so When the upper low my eyes was in my ear I get a real speechless and I act so shy All I could say is I'm in 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 I got tongue tied I got tongue tied Yeah! Oh, wait, what? Well, honey, I'm, I'm trying to say I love you, yeah! You'd go to your car and your car would be covered in lipstick in, uh, in writing telephone numbers on well, we love you Lonnie and, and your car would be just messed. It used to be on for young and old with the women, there's no doubt about that. They'd throw themselves at you, all right. You know, it was uh, it was a uh, it was the smallest boy. The boyfriends of these girls that were doing this now, how are they feeling? We didn't seem to worry about it too much. I, I, we didn't think about it. Well, I didn't anyway. 
Right. Maybe there's a few little diggers running around out there. <laughs> So on the one hand, you've got the girlfriend going, ah, and you've got the guy going, ah, you know, that's really strange. But fame didn't always come so easily to those with talent. Some people make a fortune, and others own a mint. But my old man don't earn much. In fact, he's flipping skint. He wears a dustman's hat. He wears got blimey trousers. And he lives in a council flat. He looks a proper nana. His great big old male boots. He answers the job to pull them up. And he calls them baby roots. Barry Gibb and his younger twin brothers may have started as a novelty act, but they had a lot more going for them than cuteness. They sang for pennies between stock car races at Brisbane's Redcliffe Speedway. They were rescued by that other set of entrepreneurial brothers, the Jacobsons. My name is Barry Gibb. I live at 26 Cambridge Avenue, Surface Paradise, and my first song is Let Me Love You. <laughs> let me love you. I'll never let you go. And they went into their harmonies. They were sensational. Oh, wow. You are such a lovely girl. songwriting talent that would one day make them millionaires was honed on the couch at Festival Records. His music was so far ahead of any of the local writers, even, even in those days, and he was about 16 years old. He would just come into the office with his guitar and sit in the, on the couch for the afternoon in, in our uh, lounge and uh, he would just churn out these songs. He would just think of an idea overnight and churn them out. It seemed Australia had found an original songwriting talent. But what would it do with them? Meanwhile, Johnny O'Keefe set off to try and crack it as an Australian abroad. He shamelessly sold himself as a novelty act in the USA, the Boomerang Boy. Having recognised the need for Australian artists to connect with international audiences to survive, he started another great Australian rock and roll tradition, Coming Home Broke. Emotionally drained, he refused to give up. But by 1960, he was an accident waiting to happen. So I came home without any money, pretty dejected, and I didn't want anyone to know how I really felt. So I looked around, uh, and I sold my Zephyr car, and I bought the biggest flashes, Plymouth Red Belvedere that I could find. He played up his car crash for the publicity and tried to reinvent himself on commercial TV as, of all things, the mild one. It was a joke, but he was never the same. Those who had assumed rock and roll was a passing fad seemed to be right. It had lasted four years instead of nine months, but by the early 60s, it was rock and roll light, and novelty dominated TV. Teenage twist fans run riot in the overseas terminal at Mascot Airport as they wait to greet the high priest and inventor of the craze, Chubby Checker. The early 60s was an era of waves and crazes. Lee Gordon's last gasp was the twist. Soon after bringing Chubby Checker to Australia, Lee was discovered dead in a London hotel room. Chubby was soon forgotten, run over by what was arguably Australia's first national dance, the stomp. Yes, the stomp. What a dance. What an absurd dance. Stomp classes, stomp comps, stompathons. Anybody could do it, of course. That was the most important thing. Anybody could do it. You didn't have to have any sort of rhythmic sort of uh, uh, in your body at all. You could just stomp away. Fourteen-year-old little Patty arrived fresh from Sydney's Maroubra Beach, where she'd been stomping. Oh, I would never play my records. Never. Oh, 
We had our own flavoured surf music and the stomp was a dance that I think it came out of the fact that we were not really part of the rock and roll era, we kids. We didn't have those sort of clothes. We were real dags, you know. We had T-shirts and cut-off jeans or jeans and sloppy joes and we're pretty grubby looking lot but we thought we were really cool. Along with the stomp came the surfing lifestyle. A visitor to an Australian oceanside suburb during the summer might think that the surfers had seized power in a teenage coup d'etat. They're everywhere. And the radio stations reinforced that impression with their recurrent surf bullet. Surf music also offered local rockers a second chance. Johnny Devlin, Digger Ravel, the Joy Boys and the Deltones all dropped in on the wave. Oh well it's early in the morning and it's time to make a start And I put my poly surfboard on the rack upon my car I head down to the surf slide where the waves are breaking fine I'm gonna catch a mountain but I won't go down the mine You gotta walk the plank, ride the hook Corner left and right and keep it nice and tight And now the time is drawing near, you're moving down the wall Now steady as she goes, you got your toes upon the nose And now you're hanging five The, Malibu. the groovy surf lyrics to the Deltones hit Hanging Five were written by Detective Sergeant Ben Acton of the Manly Police. He said along this rather crude tape, it was dreadful, awful things. Sorry Ben, but it was just dreadful. And, um, and, but the hook was there and this was the main ingredient. It was Everybody talked about the hook and the sound. The music that came with the surfing scene may have been treated as if it were just another novelty, but there was something else going on. Come on, Dallas. Come on, Dallas. Surf culture stayed because it was less about angst than freedom. Yeah. <laughs> I like that beat. A group of teenagers from Sydney's eastern suburbs put down a version of the surf sound that was to prove the rock and roll tide had not gone out forever. We just realised you had to be different. You know, after the, the, the rejections by all the major companies, it became obvious we had to be different enough to stand out anywhere. These are the Atlantics and Crusher. were Australia's first big guitar band. They sounded different because they took risks. People are always moved by drums, you know, and it's, it's, the, it's the, I don't know, the primitive in all of us. So that's where we sort of lent towards that solid drum sound and then moved it in with the guitars. The effects, you know, Jim was playing with his teeth, you know, he's using a, you know, a ring to get sounds. Sound effects. We were always uh, dropping uh, metal objects on the guitars to find out, you know, like slide things, and uh, we were getting sirens out of a guitar. The Atlantic's Bombora was an Australian number one, which charted all over the world and was chosen by America's Cashbox magazine as its record of the week. They didn't know we were a local band, they thought we were an American band. Well, later John years. Laws told me, and so did uh, Bob Rogers, that if they'd have known it was an Australian record, they probably wouldn't have played it which is good in a way because they played it purely on the merit. They thought, oh, this sounds great, let's play it.
The surf sounds seem to have been dumped on the sand by the receding rock and roll wave. But a lot of guitar players were listening and learning. We wanted to give people a, a show. People, people have seen guitars, everyone's got a guitar. So we had to try and make our guitars look and sound different. Which was plain, so, you know, with the bottom E string of the guitar with the vibrato, you know, with a you know, and then machine guns. Which and I think years later, Hendrix was doing ball. machine guns, but he wasn't around at that time doing that type of sound effect, yeah. The Atlantic's live gigs at Surf City and Sydney's King's Cross became the epicentre of something new that had nothing to do with surfing and would be the biggest craze yet. It was the Beatles who crested that wave, but as well as sending their fans crazy, their success would inspire another generation of Australian musicians. In time, they would take over the networks that the pioneering rock and rollers had created from nothing. They showed us how to live it, how to sell it, and how to play it. But the ones who taught us how to write it were more or less forced to leave the country to survive. RPM, Morris. Okay, 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 right. Let's take off over. Romeo, X-ray gold, we're from Egypt. They got the sack from festival the same time as the Rajas did. <laughs> uh, in fact, uh, when I was in a the festival, they played me some of these old tapes that they'd found of the Bee Gees that they were going to release, and they were trying to think of a name for the uh, for the CD. And I said, "Why don't you call it? We're sorry we sacked you." <laughs> the Bee Gees' exit was to be the first of many by Australian rock and roll bands. The pattern was set: if you made it overseas, you'd be taken seriously at home. It was a long way to the top, right round the world. Where is the sun that shone on my head? The sun in my life, it is dead, it is dead. She is gone. She is gone.
I've Been Everywhere has been a great song for me. It's the only hit song I ever had, uh, and I still do it every show. Uh, I must admit there was a time in my, in my career where I decided not to do it anymore, but people kept on asking for it, so I've put it back in again. Um, every time I do it, there's always the risk that I'm going to blow it anyway because it's still, it's still a difficult song to do. It still just doesn't come easily. You still have to concentrate on the song. This industry is a funny old business. It's, um, it's very easy to, um, to join the party. It's very easy just to, just to decide that everybody else is having a good time, so I might as well have a good time. And it's happened to too many uh, fine entertainers um, who've either started um, drinking and uh, along with, with, with the guests, you know, the, 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 the audience are drunk, so why can't I be? Well, that's, that certainly doesn't, doesn't happen. And the people who've maintained in this industry, I've been in the business 40 years now. Uh, people like Cole Joy has been in the business, you know, longer than that. Uh, uh, you have to treat it as a, as a business. The difference between now and then is that uh, I don't think anybody's libido changes from one generation to the next. I think it's just where, where the libido has the opportunity to, to manifest itself, you know? And back then, that, that's, why you, that's why we all wanted to have a car, because the drive-in theatre was generally the scene for any trysting, you know? <laughs> but at least they say they've all got their own flats or, or whatever. So um, uh, it, 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 it was just innocent, good fun back then. Uh, my and, and I guess things enhance, like uh, distance, memory enhances the thing. But I seem to remember those days just being plain good fun. The worst thing we ever did was sometimes a, a real rebel would, would, would smuggle a bottle of scotch in his, in his hip pocket, in, in his inside pocket into a dance. But generally it was just, you'd have a few beers before the dance. Nobody knew about drugs. I remember when I was, when I'd been in the business for maybe 10 or 12 years, and I was professionally in the industry, Somebody mentioned that they thought that they heard this rumor that some jazz musicians were smoking this thing called marijuana. I thought, oh my God, drugs. It was so innocent back then, you know? The only form of management we had was our record company. There were no professional managers around. And the only people who were really, who really prospered during that business and who ultimately became the big stars of that industry were the people who had professional management. Um, Johnny O'Keefe managed himself very, very well. He was a very intelligent man, John. Uh, his brother, Barry O'Keefe, is, is, is an in indication of, of the intelligence of that family. Um, Cole Joy, of course, had the Jacobson, which, which was a networking family, and once again, very uh, astute businessmen. The rest of us just did the best we could. The rest of us just uh, went along for the ride. It was good fun. If you made some money, great. Most of the original material back then was being reco recorded by the people who wrote it. For example, Johnny Devlin used to write a lot of his own material, but he recorded the songs. Uh, Cole wrote, uh, well, the family, the, the Jacobson wrote some songs, but they recorded them. So to get a r good original m material, you either had to write it yourself or get it from overseas. I used to go into Festival Records and lovely Hal Saunders, who was the A&R manager at Festival, used to um, have a pile of records that we could look through to see if there's any material in there. But unfortunately, Cole Joy and Johnny O'Keefe and T.B. Rich had looked through the pile first. <laughs> I was about fourth or fifth cab off the rank, you know. So, and it was really, I was, also they used to come up with ideas, suggestions for, for records. And because, because I was so naive, because I was, you know, uh, here's uh, Happy Birthday, record that. I go, oh yeah, wow, Happy Birthday, I'll record it. So I, I made a lot of records back then that I wish to God I never made. And when you go to the country now and people say, oh, I've got an old record of yours, listen to this one. You go, oh, no, <laughs> hate it, hate it. I suppose you could say that, that music has gone, has gone the, the, the full circle. I don't think that, that rock and roll music per se has ever not been popular. There has always been a market for rock and roll music because our peer groups still want to hear the music that they grew up. It, we, what we're talking about here is memory. We're talking about... Uh, people coming in, sitting down, listening to uh, an hour, an hour's music, and reliving their youth. That's what it's all about. I've been everywhere. Well, I suppose when Ben Johnny O'Keefe exploded uh, around about. Not so much in 57 when he did that Bill Haley tour. 
because I mean Johnny really had to to get the Lee Gordon and uh, anyone who knows that, that story that happened to me there at the time will know that Johnny had to beg and I mean beg Lee Gordon to put him on that show and Lee Gordon said he would uh, providing Johnny was willing to play the part of Johnny and the DJs the first DJs in the 50s Johnny and the DJs could be say the warm-up act for Bill Haley in the comments I mean, even um, Rock Around the Clock, as you know, had come out in 1954 and just totally ignored by me and everybody else. And when it came back the following year in Blackboard Jungle, we were even more certain then that there really was something happening. And Johnny knew it and I knew it. And uh, by this stage, I was starting to, uh, to get an idea of, of what rock and roll was really all about. And looking at all the new releases coming out of record companies here in Australia, we were still getting Doris Day and Frankie Lane and Johnny Ray and people like that. And so I wrote to Rick once again, still an American, mind you, my friend. And uh, he said, I can line you up a, a record bar in San Francisco and they can send the newer rock and roll records to you. He said, but they won't be on the chart. I said, well, in that case, you tell me what you feel is good and send the records to me. So I got maybe 30, 40 or 50 odd records every week. Then we had the import service in 57, and we started getting records direct from record companies in America. But the big companies in America, big record companies, they really had little or no knowledge of rock and roll in their early days. RCA had Presley, right? But in the meantime, the little companies, uh, Dot Records and Challenge Records and other record companies, they were supplying nearly all the rock and roll records that were on the billboard and the cash box charts. Before the big companies even knew uh, where they were, they suddenly found these hundreds of small record companies in America recording rock and roll. And, you know, the companies were saying, you know, like Columbia or CBS or uh, the other companies, what's happening, you know, what is happening? They never knew themselves. But when they saw them make the chart, and uh, then they moved in and they bought them out, of course. And all of a sudden, rock and roll really did explode. Now, Johnny O'Keefe got uh, his chance in, uh, on the Bill Haley tour in 57, just simply to warm up the crowd. And I do know that in Sydney, that Johnny was booed when he first went on stage. Johnny and the DJs, the kids wanted American because the Sydney DJs of that day, Bob Rogers, John Laws, Tony Withers, they were playing rock and roll and they were playing American. Stan Rowe from Melbourne was the only DJ Monday to Friday playing rock and roll, but Stan Rowe was playing American. We couldn't wait for those imports to arrive on Wednesdays and Thursdays. To us, local talent, you know, it just did not exist. I knew Johnny O'Keefe had something. So did Bill Haley, because Bill Haley got back to America in late March and sent Johnny O'Keefe, you hit the wrong note, Billy Goat. And so Johnny went to Festival, and that's the first record that they made, that Festival really made, as a rock and roll record. And uh, it never got very much airplay in Sydney at all. You hit the wrong note, Billy Goat. Even though 2UE had the first top 40 chart in Australia. Uh, we had no top 40 chart down here till about 1960, but we did have a record bar called Coles 200 in Burke Street, and they had the top 40 best-selling records for the year. For the, for the week up there, each and every week. But we had Johnny O'Keefe up there, number one. You hit the wrong note, Billy Goat. And I was playing the hell out of it. And that really was the way I, I sort of made Johnny O'Keefe at that time. And, and Johnny and I then became very, very close personal friends. And it wasn't really until, uh, and I was still intent on playing uh, American records. I mean, you'd go through there to try and find a, a new Chuck Berry, maybe a little Richard this week, a Presley, whatever it might be. And you got terribly excited. You got the heart and pound away and you'd sweat. You couldn't find a turntable fast enough. You know, it, that's the way rock and roll got to me. And uh, we had a great scene going down here. By 1963, we'd gone for nowhere. And sort of having had that uh, inspiration from Johnny O'Keefe and seeing him on, seeing him work live, and meeting all the people he was putting on, uh, putting on that show in Sydney from 1959, I mean, that really inspired me. And Johnny knew I was doing it down here. And Johnny did all he could to help me down here. Meanwhile, I also played all the Johnny O'Keefe records coming out because once Johnny O'Keefe got six o'clock rock rolling, you can imagine every record company in this country wanted Johnny O'Keefe to record for them. <laughs>